Hello folks, I hope you're having a good day today. Hey, today I want to take a, I want to pause for a moment in my sort of um, August, um, I'm about ready to move into August Durleth as a part of my sort of Cthulhu Mythos um, October. And we're moving into some of his stories that he published at the same time as Lovecraft and then maybe one or two of his stories after Lovecraft passed away um, and so forth as a part of the month that I have dedicated. And before I do so, I want to take a little bit of a pause and just kind of talk about Lovecraft and Derleth and who these people are and so forth. Um, and so I want, want and the reason why I want to do that is because August Derleth is going to change the Cthulhu mythos in some major ways, both as he's writing at the time of Lovecraft and afterwards too. Um, and in a very real way, today, people who are coming to the Cthulhu Mythos or reading the Cthulhu Mythos or encountering it in video games, board games, uh, RPGs, whatever, and they are encountering sort of more of a Durleth Mythos than the Lovecraft Mythos as originally designed. So today I want to take a look at the Durleth uh, versus Lovecraft and take a look at them. Now there are a lot of people out there who don't like the Durleth style of... Uh, they, they disagree with some of the changes that he makes to the mythos. And there are basically three major attacks that they're going to make about them. So what I want to do today is kind of unpack uh, sort of where, where these are coming from, what Durleth does to the mythos, why they're, why he's probably justified in doing some of them, and so forth. Why the third one, I think, and why I think the third one is, I think, the one that's hard to justify, and I think that's actually the main issue that I have with Durleth, um, and so forth. Um, the, one, one of the major attacks I actually agree with is the final, basically, of the three I'll take a look at. But basically what I want to do is take a look at where the attacks come from, why they're there, and also where, where I think some of the Durleth, you know, Defenders are also going to say, hey, look, it's not as bad as you think it is because of X, Y, and Z. You know, it's more fleshed out. It's more it's more difficult to do that. And I've, one of the things I've done for you is I've actually reviewed for you some of the stories we're going to take a look at today. So you can kind of take a look and see kind of for yourself where some of the, defense are, the defenses come from and so forth that are happening during this time. Um, but again, it's important to remember that we would not know who Lovecraft is. We would not be having this conversation without August Derleth and Donald Wandre, who co-founded uh, Arkham House and kept Lovecraft going, particularly Derleth. I thought this was his main passion, uh, and so forth. And yet, he may have made some changes. You may not have liked it, but you know what? You know about it because of him. So, it, well, <laughs> everything we talk about is definitely a caveat of sort of, you know, of the, the Derleth versus Lovecraft. Now, I'm using the flashy name, Der Lovecraft versus Derleth, because I do think it sometimes characterizes that way. I don't think it's as much that way as some others may, but that's fine. I'm happy to sort of engage you with that. So we're going to take a look, again, probably a few stories here coming up. Uh, the Walker on the Wind, um, Ithaca, um, and... <sighs> Lair of the Star Spawn are coming up. I'm taking a look at those three stories, and each of those are going to begin to introduce some changes that Durdolph is going to make, um, and so forth. So what I want to do for you is kind of take a look at the three changes that Durdolph has made to the mythos, and why, if you're reading it or coming to it today, you're definitely coming to it from a place of this is hey, where uh, more of a you're now reading a Durdolph mythos rather than sort of the original mythos as Lovecraft wrote it um, in, the, in the late 20s and early 30s. So let's take a look. The first thing that, that, that Durleth does to the mythos, and you're going to see this in the first story that we're going to turn to, the Lair of the Star Spawn, heavily. He, he turns it from a um, these great old ones that are out there and elder, God, elder ones and so forth, and, he, and there are a number of people out there, and there's definitely war in heaven um, in, in a number of works you're going to see it you're going to see races exterminating each other killing each other war and conflict uh, by these powers that are much more powerful than us and don't care about us at all are definitely an ongoing sort of um, thing that's happening within within the world um, but what Durleth is going to do is he's going to add basically a major war in heaven if you will uh, between uh, the older ones and the great old ones and the elder gods that are basically warring uh, and so forth, and we can call on the Elder Ones for their aid in helping to defeat uh, the minions of Cthulhu, the Great Old Ones, uh, Nyarlathotep, you know, and all these really big bads. And so there's basically this war in heaven, if you will, um, and we can kind of bring about the Elder Ones onto our cause, we can help them to work for us, maybe not without, without them not even knowing, um, and so forth, and you're going to see that hard in Lair of the Star Spawn. You're also going to see it in some other things that are coming down the pike, too. Um, now, basically what this will do is, it basically does two things to the mythos. The first is, is that it changes the mythos' tone uh, to good versus evil. One, not a tr more traditional sort of good and evil are not a part of this conversation because the creatures that we are fighting with are beyond evil. They are they are beyond our definition of evil. They are they are so 
incomprehensible um, and so forth that they're beyond our, our sort of petty sort of ideas of good versus evil. And a good example of that is actually Hounds of Tindalos by Frank Bell Knapp Long, which I've already reviewed for you. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. And in that storyline, he talks about how um, the Hounds of Tindalos and the, the stuff that this person was encountering, um, that these creatures came from before good and evil were created. These concepts existed and so forth. Um, so they are not good, they are not evil, and they certainly aren't by our sort of vantage point. Um, but, um, so, but, so, but they are definitely, th this idea though of, of good versus evil is something that Derleth brings in. But it's also important to point out, I also gave you the Dunwich Horror too, which is, as, as my third review as we started this sort of journey off together as we look through these sort of Lovecraftian sort of concepts, and I do think it's important to point that out because in, in the Dunwich Horror, and it's, it's, it's not satire or anything like that. It's, it's, it's meant to be taken seriously. <laughs> you know, I've read it like three or four times. Um, it's written by Lovecraft. In, in it, it's, it's very clearly cast as good versus evil. And good wins at the end. It's, you know, it's, and it's very clearly a good versus evil sort of casting. So this idea then that, that, that the mythos itself has this sort of good versus evil war and conflict. Um, and while, yeah, a lot of the evil people are here on Earth, but we can kind of tap into good to help us, is not something that wouldn't have felt out of place for somebody who's reading the Dunwich Horde and then immediately turned uh, to a Durlow story or, or to the later stuff, too. Uh, so there is some place for that here and there. Also, Frank Belknap Long also makes a mistake himself, which I've also given you, too, the Space Eaters, uh, where you can do signs of the cross and so forth and force away the bad guys. And so forth, this sort of, uh, which is definitely, <laughs> uh, definite, uh, as he sort of Christian, Christ, uh, Christianizes the, uh, the, the the Cthulhu mythos and so forth. So you can make the sign of the cross and they'll, they'll flee. Um, so there's definitely that feeling too, even in Bel Belknap Long's stuff too, um, which is written before this. So this idea that Derleth adds to this uh, mythos of the central conflict happening between the Elder Ones and the Great Old Ones, and, and, the, and basically between good and evil, um, and we can call on the good ones, the, the Elder Ones, to come help us out is definitely something that he adds and makes a key point of future mythos stories, the future mythos and such. Um, he's going to emphasize that a whole lot. But it's not, and so that's how the mythos will read today. If you're, if you're playing a video game and so forth, there's this, there's this versus thing. That was not originally written um, into the mythos. It's been added later. But again, the central good versus evil conflict is there too. So I think you can, I think you can, Make an argument either way on that one um, as to whether or not you you think it's uh, good or not. I, I think I think um, it was already there. I think that it was it was there in a lot of Lovecraft's works. But I do think that Lovecraft himself rarely dipped into that thing uh, and so forth. So I would not have made it the key sort of infrastructure ethically of my stories moving forward and my mythos. But I do think it would be fine occasionally to do uh, and so forth, because he, but he only does it like once or... I mean, it's not something he regularly is going to dip his toes into uh, and so forth. So the fact that he didn't do it to me, he didn't do it in Call, he didn't do it in Call, he didn't do it in Shadow, he didn't do it in uh, Whisper in Darkness. You know, he doesn't do it in Shadow Out of Time. He doesn't do it, you know, you know I, I can point to tons of mythos stories where he doesn't do it. Um, Colorado Space. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not this good versus evil conflict and good wins at the end and so forth. So I, I, I would agree that I don't think it's probably great that every single mythos story has to have this moving forwards as the central sort of conflict of, of, the, of the mythos um, as this sort of war in heaven is going on. But I, do, but I don't disagree with it in theory. Um, or, or being added to a particular story. I don't have as much of, I don't have an issue with it. Anyway, that's the first change that he makes. The second change that he makes, on the other hand, can be a little more controversial for some and a little less for others. Basically what he does is he assigns elements to the various um, creatures that are out there. He'll give um, the Cthulhu um, the element of water and control over that, that, that domain. Um, he'll also um, assign some to, I think he assigns a Shubnigareth, I think, to Earth. Uh, and so forth. Um, he'll actually, one of the ones that he creates, Ithaqua, he'll give to Wind. He'll also create one called Cthaga, which is, I think, probably one of the worst editions <laughs> that he makes. It's very uninspired uh, and so forth in the, in the fire uh, section and so forth. But basically, he's creating these sort of elemental concepts and constrictions and so forth. Um, and this, so that most of these characters have an elemental aspect attached to them. And while I do, th and so, so, and, and again, there is this sort of um, element, I think, uh, to a lot of the stories that Lovecraft is writing. More deep, more be below things. I don't think Lovecraft probably realized it at the time. 
But I think when you go back and read the Call of Cthulhu, sure. I, I think you can see sort of a water elemental from a door of a deeper um, o overarching sort of a concept. Yeah, maybe, but not sort of the the sort of fast, you know, you know, um, bounds that happened uh, with the specific elementalists and so forth and, and elemental powers and elemental weaknesses and so forth that comes with being a water elemental and so forth. So, so in that sort of sense, no. Um, but yeah, it's sort of in a sort of a grander, bigger scale, maybe the more of control of the water. That's where his, that's where his location is on an island, um, and so forth. Uh, so yeah, and he's got the physical features of sort of this giant, uh, sort of you know, uh, aquatic monster. So sure, I could sort of buy it maybe um, in places like that, in sort of a grand scale, but not sort of in this more specific elemental scale, according to the detractors of August Durlow. And so forth. Um, and in my mind, I would not say that, um, and, and so the detractors say this isn't a part of the mythos, it wasn't intended, uh, and so forth. And it's another sort of derlithization of the Cthulhu mythos. And I kind of agree with them, although I disagree with some of their points. I think, to my mind, I don't think that Cthulhu and his various people are so mundane as to be an elementalist. And to be sort of, I, I would argue that just like they are not. Um, a part of they are they are beyond beyond good and evil and not a part of our our human moral infrastructure. I would also I would also argue that they are beyond our sort of earthly uh, concept of elements and so forth. Um, they, they, defining them by fire, water, air, and earth is not really a particularly meaning. It's, it's not it's not something that I, I think they're beyond that. I, I think I think to do so is to is to 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 to, to sell their power uh, and who they are sh and character short. Um, so so that would be my major criticism. Of this, of the elemental addition to the to it, but again, I get where Dorf is coming from in sort of a general sense. Uh, uh, this, seeing these sort of general scenes and so forth, the uh, physical traits of some of these people, uh, some of the big ones, uh, as they're being described um, and so forth, like Sethagua and so forth. So I get it. I get where he's coming from. I get where he's, although to a lesser degree, uh, but but also his. So now, as you read the Cthulhu Mythos stuff, you're going to come across this this sort of elementalization that comes from August Erdl. So, and then the final one I have the biggest uh, of the three that I have. This is my big issue. I, I can, I'm fine. I, I can read stories that are in the first two that are good, um, as long as they're good. That's my major issue. Uh, I'm just that they're good, but I, I just want good stories, right? Um, if, you, if you've you know created Cthulhu because you wanted to fire Cthulhu, that's fine. I don't care. <laughs> if it's a good story, it's a good story. That's what I care about. Um, but um, the final one is my main issue, and this is by big issue with Derleth, um, is that um, he removes, he's, he's like a magician. You, you know how you have a stage magician, um, and a stage magician is going to always show you as little as possible so that you think that what they just pulled, the, 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 that the tricks they just pulled on stage um, were real, that were really magic and so forth, right? And they're going to show you as little as possible so that you believe it um, without seeing how they did it, right? And seeing through it and so forth, right? And the best stage magicians out there are going to, make, are going to do a great job creating, coming up with tricks, ways to show you things, and very little things. I think that the best Cthulhu Mythos stories out there, and I've talked about this before, are ones that don't drown you in salt, but that just use Mythos elements sparingly to help get you a stronger, more full, a fully fleshed story. Uh, um, you know, the color out of space barely uses uh, Mythos elements. Um, you know, and is a good example there. The Haunted of the Dark doesn't use them much. Um, the Winged Death only has a single paragraph in like a 20 some plus story and so forth, right? And these are great stories and that take place. The Treatment of Amboise, uh, the Black Stone, uh, and so forth. There's all these great stories that are out there by these other authors too that are not using the Mythos elements heavily. They're not having these giant. Now, there are a few out there and Hey, look, the Dunwich Horror is another example that brings them out, has these big giant uh, characters are being brought out and so forth. But I think the best stories out there in the Cthulhu Mythos are ones that only use it a little bit here and there sparingly. And August Durlith is the exact opposite. In fact, I would argue that August Durlith is that magician who makes their living in any, every generation by showing you how magician acts are done. Um, and you know, how, and there's going to be like this mass magician who's like, uh, super secretly, I'm telling you who how these things are done. And I'm doing it in order to hide away because I don't want people to tell me, you know. Uh, and I think that, that's August Durlif. He's not the master magician. He just shows you how master magicians did their tricks, and so forth, um, and thus removes a lot of the magic from. <laughs> and I think that's I think August Durlif's great issue that I have with him um, is that he will write these stories that have so much Cthulhu mythos in them. 
and explain away all the things that are happening. Um, and, um, and he will give you all these details and stuff. And I think that he over details in story. In fact, we'll take a look at one of his stories, The Walker on the Wind. Uh, not my next story, but two stories down the road. And I think he does this perfectly, and this will be a perfect example of it. I think there's a paragraph that if he removed from that story, it would be a much better story. Think about that as as a as a writer, right? If 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 if, if I am if if there are things that you could remove from your story because you're giving too much detail in the world, you're connecting it too much, and it would make your story stronger. You got too much salt in there. You got to, got to pull back on some of that salt, and that is my main issue with Durleth. He has pulled back the covers. He has shown too much of the of the mythos. He's talked about too much and so forth. Hey, if he wanted to have uh, the good a good versus evil thing, sure. Don't show me as much as he does. You want to have um, elementals? Sure. Don't show me as much as he does. You know, don't tell me as much as he does. You know, make it more hidden. And, if, and, and, and he'll do this, the same thing with many of his other short stories, novels and novellas, where he pushes um, way too much mythos stuff. And I think that this is, um, in my, I've talked a little bit about in, in sort of my generational sort of overviews. I also think this is something a lot of other writers in Gen 2, 2 do as well. Gen 3 is even worse. Um, Gen 1 writers are the ones writing at the same time as Lovecraft. I think that they have a lot of strong uh, ways. They, they write, they tend, there's, there's exceptions, but they tend to write stories that are different, that are of their own, and that take um, Cthulhu Mythos elements and sort of use them uh, to, to spice up a story or connect them. But they're not, um, in and of themselves, being written as a mythos story first and foremost. Durleth's stuff is written as a Cthulhu Mythos story first. Um, as well as many other things that come in Generation 2, from about 1940 until about 1960. Um, and his, him and many of the people who are writing at the same time are writing mythos stories. They're, they're going into it writing mythos stories and so forth. And I think that's that's one of my major issues with it, is that they're, they're intentionally writing a story in the mythos rather than writing a story, a mythos story, that first rather than a story that should be in the mythos second. Uh, a good story. I want a good story for And then that's even a bigger issue in Generation 3, though, under Lynn Carter. Lynn Carter will write stories, for example, that will... he, he it, it seems like he's just writing them only because there's some reference to some story that he's reading that hasn't been ever been explained, so he'll grab his pen and spend 12 pages telling you what it is. He doesn't... And then he'll be done with it, and he'll set it aside. He, he really more... It feels like he's really kind of doing it to fill in the blanks rather than actually fleshing out the world or because he was inspired by something it's like we're really passionate about he just feels like he's just doing it re by rote at this point in time um for, for the 20 years or so of generation three um so i think generation three is even uh does does has Durrell's sins much stronger <laughs> uh, much more strongly and so forth but again i don't think that a, I, I don't think so. i think many of the attacks against Durleth. hey look the dunwich horde did him lovecraft does him uh, and so forth. So I, I, many other writers were writing at the same time uh, as Lovecraft did do them too. You know, Belknap Long, um, you know, is not the first one. You know, for example, um, you're going to see Robert E. Howard is going to do it with the Black Stone. He's going to have the sacrifices, uh, the cultic ceremonies, you know, all that stuff. He's not the only one. Lovecraft does it too. Others do it too. So so many of the sort of the attacks on Durlo, I think, are unfounded. And I do think that some of the stories, the third story we'll actually look at him, Ithaca, is actually a really good story. Um, yeah, it's the part of his sort of elementalization of the mythos, but it's a good story. It's probably the best one of the three we're kind of taking a look at. So I like it because it's a good story. Um, but again, that's Durliff. So we'll be taking a look at him in a, in a, in a little bit moments. But again, I want to just take a pause right here and just take a look at kind of how Durliff changes the mythos and why a lot of fans of from modern day that are coming to it will know the Durliff mythos a lot. Um, and having read some of the Lovecraft stuff, now we're going to be taking a look at some of the Durliff mythoses and some of the changes that he makes to the mythos over the course of the next three stories. Um, also, I, I want to put a pause on this. Where, where do you think, uh, where do you fall on the Durliff versus Lovecraft thing? Do you think that Durliff was following Lovecraft's vision? more closely than some do do you disagree with me do you agree with me happy to talk with you more about it in the comments below and hey if you like this video there's no reason not to hit the subscribe button i take a look at a lot of these sort of classics and i also take, like to take occasionally outside of the review of these forgotten classics i also like to take do something like this where i pause and take a look and deep dive into a topic that's inspired by some of the things that i'm doing uh, and then finally hey if you watch this video all the way to the end i just want to thank you for taking some time out to do your day we all have such busy days and busy lives and so the fact that you took a few minutes out uh, to spend it with me that's something that i take uh, very seriously so thanks again